Hello, everyone, and welcome to Black History Quest. Uh, my name is Zachary, and I am your host. Uh, this is the second episode of Oregon Black Pioneers History Research and Conversation Program. Uh, if you didn't catch the first episode, uh, we had a great time learning about the Bayless family in Salem, and we've got another really interesting story to dig into tonight. So I'm really excited for you joining us uh, for this program this evening. And we're also very grateful for our sponsor for Black History Quest Roundhouse Foundation. Um, if you don't know, Oregon Black Pioneers is Oregon's only statewide African-American historical society. And we do exhibitions and programs like this, anything that we can do to share Black history in our state with you. Uh, so we're coming to you live right now on the Oregon Black Pioneers Facebook page and the Oregon Black Pioneers YouTube page. And it is there on YouTube where you can find the recordings of previous episodes as well. So just a bit of background about what Black History Quest is and how it works. Uh, back in 2022, we recruited talented historical researchers that we've worked with before uh, to act as our history investigators. And we asked them to look into some of the materials in the Oregon Black Pioneers archive that we wanted to know more about. Uh, just because we keep something doesn't know we mean that we know all about what it is or what it represents. Uh, so we turn those materials over to our history investigators to see if they might be able to uncover what is the bigger story that those materials represent. So sometimes those things could be newspaper clippings, it could be objects, um, it might be written correspondence, but no matter what it is, uh, we know that there is a story worth telling and we want to know what those stories are. So after uh, we hear the presentation this evening, we'll have a chance for some conversation to learn a bit more about our researchers' work. Um, and we also will have time to take questions from the audience. So if you think of any questions as you're listening to the presentation, please drop them in the chat and we will come to the best ones and answer them live here on screen. So without further ado, I would like to introduce this evening's presenter. I'm very thrilled to be able to welcome Pamela Filbert to the program today, someone that we've had a chance to work with before around the research on Beaver Hill, also in Coos County, the site of tonight's program as well. Pamela is a fifth generation Oregonian on her mother's side and an eighth generation Californian on her father's side. She attended Whitman College in Walla Walla, Washington and graduated from the University of Oregon with a BA in psychology and a minor in history. After graduation, Pamela moved to London for six months, where she met and was engaged to another Oregonian uh, who was on a semester abroad program from Willamette University. After returning to the U.S. and getting married, uh, they lived in New York City and then in Forest Grove and then in Salem, where Pamela lives today. Pamela began doing genealogical research 10 years ago and enjoys using these skills that she developed from research on her own family stories um, and on telling the stories of others. She currently helps with the Truth and Justice Working Group of the Episcopal Church of Western Oregon and has contributed to the blog of American Ancestors and New England Historical Genealogical Society in Boston for the past five years. Please join me in welcoming Pamela Filbert. Hi, Zachary. Hey, Pamela. Good to see you. Great to see you. So for Black History Quest, we always start by talking about the source that inspired your research uh, into the topic of your choosing. So could you tell us first, what is the source that you were looking at? Um, the source is from what was called then the Coos Bay Times. It's now become the world, uh, a publication out of Coos Bay. And uh, I ran across it in a, a newspaper search and the terms that I'd put in all of a sudden popped up this article and it sounded more than intriguing. And so when I was asked to research something, this seemed like it was worth looking into. And that topic of course was in regards to uh, the murder or mysterious death of a person of African descent in Marshfield. Uh, which is not the first time that we've heard a story like that. Of course, right. uh, Marshfield being the site where Alonzo Tucker was lynched uh, years earlier than this. What were your questions about that source uh, that inspired you to start doing this work? Um, just the headline made it sound really ominous. And then doing a little, the little I knew from the newspaper articles that I followed up with, um, 
made it sound like even at the time people were suspicious about whether this was being fully investigated by the local law enforcement and uh, steps that the African-American community in Marshfield took to try to get justice for Timothy Pettis. Very interesting. Well, this is a heavy topic, certainly heavier than last episode, um, but it's an important one. And I know that I'm looking forward to hearing more about this story from you. So with that, I'll turn it over, take it away, Pamela. All righty. All right, just so everyone knows, um, sometimes the subject of this talk is going to be called Timothy and sometimes Frank for reasons I don't fully understand. Frank was the name that his wife and friends called him. And I'm sure there's a story about that, but we will probably never know that. But we'll jump into what I have been able to find out. And before we get started though, I do want to make sure that everyone is aware that this deals with the murder and the mutilation of a young black man who was last seen alive being chased by the police. There are no graphic images, but the topic itself is disturbing. So this was the article that I found that got me going. Timothy Pettis, Body in the Bay, Maybe Foul Play. Negro janitor who disappeared Sunday night may have been murdered. Had quarreled with sailors off the shirk. Last seen running down the railroad track when pursued by night police. Never seen alive again, which sounds pretty ominous. But before we jump into the story of Timothy Pettis, it's helpful to get a little idea about the geography and the population of the times. Um, not everyone has been to Coos Bay, even if they've been in Oregon a long time. Um, so this is a map of it. And the top block in red shows the city of North Bend. And the bottom one is the city of Marshfield, now known as the city of Coos Bay. Um, and here's a little bit of, of census data from 1920, so just four years before this happened, um, with the populations of North Bend and Marshfield. So combined, those two cities are a little over 7,000 with about 15,000 altogether in the whole Coos Bay area and a little over 22,000 in the entire county. And for comparison, there's Multnomah County where Portland's located. So it was over 10 times the population of Coos County. Um, one thing to bear in mind is that lumber was huge there and reputedly the largest lumber mill in the world at the time was in Coos Bay. So it was you know, like punching above its weight as far as um, what it was putting out compared to the number of people who lived there and the comparative remoteness of where it was. And then um, it's also good to keep in mind what the racial demographics were in 1920. As you can see, there were very few people of color. Uh, in fact, it was about one half of 1% in the county, the largest group of which were indigenous people. So black men had worked in area coal mines for decades in Coos County, though by 1924, the coal was largely played out. In 1920, they were listed as laborers in a sawmill, shipyard, and freight house, as well as a tailor, barber, shoe repairer, janitor, and domestic servant. A small number of Chinese had lived in Coos Bay since the 19th century working as cooks, laundry workers, grocers, coal miners, and railroad workers. The Gao Huai family made up the largest number of Coos County Chinese in 1920. Eight Japanese were living in the mining town of Beaver Hill and one was working as a hotel cook in Bandon. But we're not sure that all these statistics are 100% complete or accurate because generally race was determined by the census taker, not by self-identification. And one example here uh, highlighted in yellow, it says Augustus Crawlinger, but it's really Augusta Gus Crawlinger. Uh, and he grew up in Beaver Hill where his father and older brother worked in the mines. He and his wife and his son were all listed on other censuses as black mulatto or Negro, and his younger siblings attended Marshfield's colored school with the oldest Gao Huai son. 
We also need to bear in mind the legacy of Alonzo Tucker and Zachary uh, referred to that a little bit. So I'll go over the details because not everyone knows what happened and those who do don't always know um, really accurate details. So just to recap, Alonzo Tucker, a young black man living in Marshfield was accused in 1902 of sexually assaulting a white woman from the nearby mining community of Libby. Dozens of white miners descended on downtown Marshfield where Mr. Tucker was being held in jail at the city hall located on the waterfront. The city marshal, Jack Carter, removed Alonzo Tucker from confinement in what he claimed was an attempt to take him by boat to another location for his safety, but there were no boats available. As the crowd closed in, Mr. Tucker jumped into the mud and hid under waterfront structures until he was found the next morning and shot multiple times. He bled to death while being transported to the 7th Street Bridge, where his body was hung from a noose. This is the only verified lynching death in the state of Oregon. So here are the statistics we're going to first look at the death certificate for Timothy S. Pettis. And most of these things are accurate, but some of them are a little fuzzy, partly because he had not been in the community that long. It says here about nine months. Um, he had been married only three months to Eva Pettis, who provided this information. Um, and it indicates that he was a janitor for Bank of Southwestern Oregon at the time of his death. That's true. Um, that he was born in Florida. That's true. This lists his father as J.E.A. Pettis of Florida. Um, it also says that his death was homicidal with the jury failing to find the cause of death. Um, fortunately, we have another vital record from just three months earlier that provides a little more detail and enabled me to go and find him definitively um, in his roots in Florida. So it turns out instead of being 30 years old, he was 23 and quite possibly he was actually only 22. But anyway, several years younger than his death certificate indicates. Um, it also says that he was a cigar maker, which is pretty unusual because we don't really make cigars in Oregon. However, um, it did, again, definitively prove his, his roots when I found him in the census. Uh, for 1910. And um, his wife was from Tennessee, and she appears to have been a decade older than he. So perhaps she didn't actually know how old he was, or she kind of fudged because she thought it looked awkward to be 10 years older than her husband. We will never know, but he was much younger than 30. Now, their wedding was so distinctive, having two people of color getting married in Coos County, that it was written up in the Coquille Valley Sentinel, and uh, it has the kind of touching note that they had, his friend said, just put a just married sign on the back of the car, and they tried to get it off, but they couldn't, so they had to drive back to Marshfield with their sign proclaiming their new status. So who was Timothy Pettis? He was named for his uncle, Timothy Samuel Pettis, who was a cigar maker. He was the son of the Reverend Abraham Lincoln Pettis, also a cigar maker, and a preacher. And it was actually his mother who was named Jeffrey E. Altamis. Both of his surviving sisters became teachers. And then his oldest sister died when she was very young, apparently. Before he came to the Coos Bay area, he worked near the Dalles and in the Dalles. He worked in Fallbridge, which is now called Wishram, Washington, uh, in the roundhouse of the Spokane Portland and Seattle Railroad in Fallbridge. And then before that, he had worked in the shops of the Oregon Washington Railroad and Navigation Company in the Dalles, which is roughly just across the river. We don't know what brought him to the Coos Bay area, but at the time of his death, he had been working for a couple of months at least at uh, the Bank of Southwestern Oregon, where he was the janitor. Uh, this bank was originally founded as Flanagan and Bennett Bank, in the late 19th century, and it was the oldest bank in Coos County, changing its name in 1917. So the bank appears in two different locations. In 1920, you can see it is the only blue building on the left map. 
um, which means that it was reinforced concrete. And then I've outlined in red where City Hall was half a block away. And that was also where the jail was located and where the fire department was located. But by 1942, um, the bank, which you can kind of pick out, again, it's blue and it's got that distinctive corner rounded section. And now it's been joined by another reinforced concrete building, but it's one block diagonally of where it had been in 1920. And it's like, why would you move a big building like that? Well, this is why. Uh, not quite two years before the Timothy Pettis story took place, there was a devastating fire on Front Street and two dozen buildings, give or take, were burned down, including City Hall. And so a decision was made to relocate the central area of business around um, Broadway Street one block away. And so the bank was picked up and moved on um, whatever you call them, skids. Anyway, it was moved um, and it was moved in 1923. So it had just been moved a year before Timothy Pettis was working there. So now that we've got that background, we'll start in. Sunday, July 6th, 1924. About 10 p.m., Frank Pettis left his room in the Gawai building telling his wife he planned to be back by 11. Frank played pool with some locals plus sailors from the USS Shirk who were in port as part of a seaplane guard. Some in the pool hall were playing cards. Frank borrowed a dollar from his friend G.L. Campbell and joked around, putting down a nickel and asking for $50 worth of chips for his friend Duke Belden. Now this is a picture of a pool hall in Marshfield, although we're not sure which one, but it gives a little context for what it was like or what it was similar to. Shortly after 11.30 p.m., Frank and his friend Joseph Hartel joined some sailors in crossing the street to the Wright Cafe. This was a 24-hour restaurant and full of sailors from the Shirk, a destroyer which had arrived in port that morning. So I hope you're all able to follow along wherever the red boxes are, that's the location in question, or sometimes there'll be more as we go on. The cafe's only waitress, Ada Lewis, felt that things were getting a little out of hand with a number of the sailors being drunk. She asked the cook and Anderson to come out and deal with the situation. He asked Pettis to leave since he and Hartel had not ordered anything and the commotion seemed to center around him. So this is a picture of the Central Hotel and the Wright Cafe was located on the front street side of it where the left red arrow is. It says eat Wright Cafe. And then up in the right uh, arrow, you can it's pointing to where it says Flanagan and Bennett Bank. So this clearly was taken a few years before the incident, but not a lot had changed except for a fire down in the next block and the removal of the bank. But the um, other buildings are much the same and we'll see another picture of it. According to Joseph Hartel's inquest testimony, the restaurant owner came in and grabbed Frank Pettis by the arm and said, if you are not going to eat, get out. Frank turned around slowly and when the owner started to shove him, Frank said, you don't have to shove me. Talk to me like a man. Someone reportedly threatened to knock him out, to which Pettis replied, you will not knock me out. I am not doing anything. If you talk to me like a gentleman, I will walk out. This is a photograph of Joseph Hartel. Frank and Joe left the cafe and Frank wandered a bit south along the block. Joe went back to the casino pool hall across the street to alert Frank's good friend, Duke Belden, about the situation and the potential for trouble. Taxi driver Chet Emery walked past the Wright Cafe on his way to the pastime pool hall in the next block. He did not enter the cafe, but testified that he saw Pettis holding a knife. He had seen the night police outside Merchant's Cafe on Broadway and went to alert them. So in this photograph, Along the left edge, that is the Blanco Hotel, and Timothy Pettis had walked that way from the right cafe, um, which is back at the kind of the other end of the same block. And behind it, you can see where the bank was located, where he worked as a janitor. But by this time, 
it's uh, on Broadway, a block away. Frank Pettis walked back to this door of the cafe, but did not go inside. According to Ed Anderson, the cook, a red-haired sailor named Slim cried out, the black son of a bee is back again, and he has got a knife. This caused a number of the sailors to take off after Pettis. Ed Anderson also ran to the door and saw the two night police officers, Ned Higley and Curly Richardson, coming down the street. The sailors chased Pettis around the army goods store on the corner and as far as Kosky's tailor shop, but Anderson called them back since the police were now chasing Pettis. So here's another shot of the um, building in question with the uh, right cafe sort of behind where that first car is. Um, and the army goods store is right there on the corner. And then Kosky's tailors is around the corner. It's in one of those red boxes. And uh, if you look at that set of two light posts, uh, it's sort of right behind them. Anderson saw officers Higley and Richardson chase Frank Pettis around the corner of the Woolen Mill store and south on Broadway. Then he and his stepson, Dennis Sorensen, left the cafe shortly before midnight to drive two of the sailors to the port dock. By the time they returned to the cafe, all the sailors had left the restaurant. So I was thankful to find a picture of the Woolen Goods store, and that's where uh, Frank Pettis and the officers turned the corner and went towards the bank building. Robert Curly Richardson testified that he chased Pettis around the back side of the bank into the alley where Pettis fell over some lumber. Richardson chased him out and was perplexed that he got by Higley. All three men then ran down central to the train tracks running along the waterfront. Curly Richardson then testified that Higley said, you go this way and I will go this. And then Higley went around the J.C. Penney store and up central while Richardson went along the docks where he asked a watchman if he'd seen anyone to which the response was no. When the two men regrouped, Higley suggested that they check in with police chief Jack Carter. So this was Curley's testimony. Hig waited around the merchant's cafe until I came back and I woke Jack up and told him how it was. I told him the only thing we had was what Chet Emery told us, that we never seen no knife or violence at all. And Jack asked if anyone had made a complaint and we said, no, nobody had said a word. To which Jack Carter said, well, I guess there is no use of trying to do anything. You never seen anything. Other testimony from Curly Richardson. Question, did you go down to the old Wright Cafe again? We went back after that and told the sailors to cut out the rough stuff and they said a little back, but nothing to amount to anything. Question, to your knowledge, has this Timothy Pettis had any other trouble? Yes. Question, in what way? He had a fight in the loggers pool hall. The chief here knows something about that. I think it was in the daytime. And he had some kind of a misunderstanding at Williams, who I believe was the traffic officer by that name. And then he had trouble with his wife, different arguments on the streets with different fellows. Question, did he ever complain to you that anybody threatened to get him? No, we never had any trouble with him, only this time. So I believe I found the article uh, that writes up a little bit about what that trouble was that he ran into at the Loggers Cafe on Front Street, uh, because you'll see um, G.L. Campbell, whose testimony is going to be described soon, he said in his testimony that he was with Frank when the trouble occurred on Front Street. And um, this article references an altercation he got to with a different person at the same time. But according to this article, a man named Paris White, who may have been a logger himself, um, walked into the restaurant where Frank was eating and slapped him on the back and said, hello, Sambo. That was his version of the story. Frank's version was that the guy came in, slapped him on the back, said, hello, Sambo, and then called him the N-word, which he objected to. And at that point, they exited and they said, whichever story is true, the Paris White was badly bruised 
And when he was trying to get witnesses to testify in his behalf, they only said they could testify in favor of Frank. So I'm not quite sure why he used the name Frank Howard or if that was a miscommunication. It's possible looking for a job, he didn't want to have his full name in there, or he may have used that name a lot. I don't know, but I'm pretty sure this gives us more details about that incident, which he was only objecting to being called a really offensive term. Joe Hartell testified that he visited the house of Mrs. Robertson, or Robinson, who lived next to the bank to see whether Eva Pettis, Frank's wife, was visiting her. He told Mrs. Robertson that Frank was getting into some little trouble. Joe went behind the bank to see if Frank was there, borrowing a flashlight from Mrs. Robertson. About this time, he heard Officer Higley shout, stop or I will shoot, and then the police started running. Hartell testified that the police later returned and Higley said, I started to drop him. When he got to that corner, I started to drop him. Curly Richardson said, well, we know where he is. Higley said, you bet. Well, I guess the black son of a bee will get out of town now and a few more like him. Hartell said that Frank had never shown a knife. Ed Anderson and Ada Lewis also had never seen a knife. Only the sailor Slim and taxi driver Chet Emery made that claim. C.I. Duke Belden testified that he left the pool hall when Hartell summoned him. By the time he arrived, sailors were standing on the corner and the police were chasing Pettis. Belden immediately headed to the Pettis residence in the Gao Huai building above Merchant's Cafe, but found out from Eva that he had not been there for an hour or so. Duke Belden testified that when he came downstairs from the Gao Huai building, he ran into Joe Hartel and heard about Higley's threat to shoot Pettis. Waiting outside on the corner, he heard Higley say, I would like to have shot him in the legs. Then Officer Richardson said he knew where Pettis had gone, and Higley also said he knew where he had gone, as well as, I would bet he will leave town now, all right, and some of those people around there. So two different people testified essentially the same thing in slightly different words. According to Belden's testimony, he had been in town only about a month but he had known Pettis for about six years since they were in the army overseas. After the police chased Pettis, Belden stayed out downtown until about 3 a.m. looking for Pettis and on alert for any more trouble. He reported that the last bunch of sailors he'd seen was about 1.30 a.m. and that there had been no more commotion. So that is the end. That takes us a little past midnight now we're to Monday morning. Mrs. Robertson visited Eva Pettis to say that there had been some sort of trouble concerning Frank in the night and that he had not made up the fire in the bank's boiler for hot water. Eva made up the fire, concerned that Frank would lose his job. She later testified that he had only once in their three months of marriage stayed out late at night and never all night. Gaston Lawrence Campbell made two statements at the inquest, although he was not summoned to testify. He heard of the incident on Monday afternoon when he came with his brother to collect garbage from the Wright Cafe. He immediately went to talk with Police Chief Carter, who said that he didn't know much about what had happened, that Higley was going on vacation, and that it was too early in the afternoon to talk with the night officers who might still be asleep. Eventually, uh, Campbell was able to speak with Richardson. Campbell had been in the casino pool hall with Pettis, Hartel, Belden, and Joe Jones until about 11.30 p.m. Sunday. He had known Eva Moore Pettis before Frank came to town and helped him get the custodian job at the bank. Pettis had been wearing a maroon-colored cap, and Campbell went down to the docks early Monday evening to look for it. He returned Tuesday when the water level was lower to look again, but found nothing. Joe Jones, who was with Pettis Sunday night, also feared foul play when Frank had not appeared by Monday afternoon. He testified that he consulted the police chief, and when Carter waved things off as nothing serious, Jones said they would have to call on the higher authorities. He called the sheriff's office in Coquille, which advised him to contact the sheriff in North Bend. 
the sheriff's deputy went to the right cafe and talked with the proprietor. And then Higley came up to the sheriff's car and explained what had happened the night before. Joe Jones also lived across the hall from the Pettises in the Gao Hui building and heard Duke Belden come looking for Frank while the police were chasing him. So I can't be sure this is a census record from 1930 for the same Joe Jones. This one indicates that he's white, but as we'd seen from that earlier census record uh, where a known person of color was listed as white, that is a possibility. Um, this gentleman is from Virginia, as were his parents, and his job was a porter in a barber shop, which at that time was a fairly common job for a man of color. And in fact, it was the exact same job that the previously mentioned Gus Trollinger had in Salem just before he died. So could be the same guy, could not be the same guy. Um, now we're to Saturday, July 12th, five days later. About 11 a.m., Roy Robertson discovered the body of Timothy Pettis while operating the tow, boot, tow boat Mabel H. for the Coos Bay Lumber Company. The body was floating in Isthmus Slough about 100 feet from the log boom closest to the city. For those of you who aren't familiar with logging and uh, sawmills, the log booms are those um, sort of containment areas and the logs float inside of them. So the log booms evidently wrapped around this um, sort of domed area. It's not really quite a um, peninsula, but you can see in the red box there where this enormous uh, lumber mill was. Fred E. Wilson, the coroner, arrived and took charge. An inquest was held that evening at the downtown Marshfield undertaking parlor where Wilson had formerly worked. John R. Skeels was both a juror and witness, having been present at the mill when the body was pulled from the water. He testified about the condition of the body and clothing when found. Dr. Everett E. Mingus was unable to determine the cause of death or whether Pettis was dead or alive when he entered the water. His facial area and neck had been eaten by crabs, but he had no other wounds to his head or body, except that both testicles had been removed. There was blood upon his undershirt and trousers. The doctor said it was normal for the body to have risen to the surface in five days instead of the average nine since it was summer. Pettis had been fully dressed with all buttons fastened, including those down the front of his union suit underwear, except the lowest trouser fly button. Pettis was wearing dark trousers, socks, tan shoes, a cardigan sweater, and soft blue shirt, both of which had a small tear in the back as from a nail or splinter with the flesh underneath unhurt. He was wearing a ring and had a bunch of keys in his pocket, most of which belonged to the bank. There was no knife. G.L. Campbell and other friends of Pettis appealed to Dr. Phil J. Kaiser of the Kaiser Brothers Hospital in North Bend to conduct another autopsy. Dr. Kaiser was mayor of North Bend at the time. Also, the city of Kaiser near Salem is named for his family. His autopsy was conducted on July 13th and was more conclusive. Body was partially destroyed and mutilated probably by crabs, but no further evidence of injury except that he had been castrated before death. Lungs show conclusively that the man was dead before being placed in the water. Condition of lungs shows that death was due to asphyxiation not caused by water. City Councilor Michael H. Malloy testified that Ned Higley had requested a vacation just before the Pettis incident. Curly Richardson's uncle, Arthur Richardson, had been sworn in as Higley's replacement and took over beginning July 7th, the day that Frank did not show up to work. Malloy also testified that the night police reported directly to the mayor, not to the chief. The mayor is the whole thing in this town. So after all of this, what the... Uh, friends of Timothy had heard and experienced and probably the fact that Officer Higley disappeared right afterwards, um, they just felt they needed more help and 
solving this mystery and bringing the killer or killers of their friend to justice. So they appealed to the governor. Now, ironically, Walter Marcus Pierce, who was governor at that time, is sometimes called Oregon's Klan governor because he won the election in 1922 uh, based in large part from support of the Klan. And in fact, um, he ran as a Democrat. And so he beat out the incumbent Republican governor who was anti-Klan. But it turns out um, Mr. Hall, I don't recall his first name, who was from Coos Bay, had nearly beat out the incumbent Republican in the primary, and he also was backed by the Klan. So we have to remember that the Klan at this time nationwide, and particularly in Oregon, was very active. Although in Oregon, since there were comparatively few people of color, as well as other places in the country, a lot of their work was anti-immigrant and anti-Catholic. But there's a certain irony that they appealed for help from the Klan governor. Now, I've been able to find very little about Eva Moore, the bride of Timothy Pettis. Um, but I was able to find a little bit in the inquest testimony and uh, in some newspaper accounts, which said that friends reported she was too emotional to testify when the inquest resumed on July 14th. But G.L. Campbell persuaded her to do so. The newspaper reported she is a small woman and appeared timid and seemed broken and weakened by her grief. And she placed this card of thanks in the newspaper to um, express her appreciation for the support she had received in this terrible time. I was able to find out that she had been in town for at least two years because she was arrested um, when she objected to offensive comments made by a drunken white man. So even though they chose not to um, sort of press charges or continue the case, she still had to pay $25 in bond. So Governor Pierce received the request and he did very quickly uh, issue um, a sort of call to the sheriff and to the district attorney in Coos County demanding that they do all in their power to bring justice and he said, those who committed this dastardly crime must be apprehended and properly tried in the courts of law. Do everything in your power to secure evidence against the guilty ones. So as part of that effort, the Coos County Court offered a $500 reward for information that would lead to the apprehension of the murderer. And in addition to that, and almost a month beforehand, uh, Tim, Timothy's friends in Marshfield took up their own collection and it ended up being $100, which you consider at that time, that was a lot of money, especially for many people who didn't earn a lot. But it was a sign of their support of him and their desire for justice. A couple of months later, the grand jury met at the um, Coos County Courthouse in Coquille to consider a bunch of cases, including uh, the Timothy Pettis murder case. But as we can see, after meeting for about three days, they said no statement is made about the Pettis murder. Mysterious slain of Marshfield Negro may be solved by later evidence. Thankfully, I was able to find um, a write-up in a book by Andy Jensen. In uh, It's about the Coos County Coroner's Office. And um, it, I'm just going to read it all because it's very interesting and this is the most information we've been able to find about the thoughts that the um, court system was having. Coroner Fred Wilson was called to tell how Pettis's body was found six days later floating in Isma Slough near the main mill of Coos Bay Lumber Company. Mutilation of the body left no doubt in the coroner's jury that Pettis had been murdered. Dr. Phil Kaiser declared the colored man was dead when thrown in the water and suggested that chloroform may have been used. More than one person is believed to have been implicated in the murder as Pettis was a powerful man and his body showed no evidence of a struggle nor of his being knocked unconscious by some weapon. Pettis may have been killed while sleeping in some other home or several assailants may have overpowered him. Officers have practically exonerated members of the destroyer crew believing mutilation would have been done only by long enemies of the man. They are inclined to believe that Pettis was killed by members of his own race as there is no evidence of motive for any white person. 
Detective H.H. H. Stiles, who had come down from Portland, may have new evidence to present as he has been working secretly for some time, having been brought here by the $600 reward offered by Coos County and by private subscription. The grand jury may bring in a John Doe indictment if evidence is not sufficient to suspect any person, or it may return a secret indictment naming the suspect or suspects. But sadly, um, it does not appear that they had enough information even to bring in a sort of potential John Doe. We don't know who did it, but um, we wanna keep it as an active case. So I could find nothing more um, about what happened. And then a month after the grand jury, the city editor of the Coos Bay Times newspaper died suddenly. And uh, as a sign of respect and thanks, uh, a uh, sort of ad was taken out or a snippet was put in the paper in which G.L. Campbell, who was clearly the community leader at this time and place, said, I consider Jack Guyton the best friend the colored people had here. Mr. Guyton seemed to be the spokesman for us, especially at the time of the Timothy Pettis murder case, he did everything he could for us. And I've taken out a snippet from uh, Coos Bay Times coverage, which was presumably written by Mr. Guyton. And his summation was, the mutilation of Pettis is probably the most shocking crime in the history of Coos County and is arousing, arousing intense public sentiment. But, Sadly, this has all faded into the mists of time. It's been nearly 100 years. Um, the current police chief could not find anything, at least that was immediately accessible in their records. And the Coos History Museum apparently did not have anything in their records about this case. So I was happy to be able to bring it to awareness. Uh, people should be, I think, aware of this. Now, Curly Richardson, one of the two police officers, stayed in the community and had a very long life. And in the late 70s, he donated his police badge to a then current police officer in the city of Coos Bay Police Force. And as part of that, there was an interview. And then the next year, there was another interview with him, talked about his photography hobby and some other things and his family. And these were a couple of quotes that I found. Things got rough sometimes, and some of the stories I could tell aren't something you'd want to print. It isn't like it is now. Sometimes we would hold the court, the jury, and the trial and sentencing right out on the street. The officer would be the judge, and the whole works. So I just want to close. This is Timothy Pettis's resting place in the Sunset Memorial Park, just south of Coos Bay. Um, his grave is right in front of us and it has no marker. The markers you see are for other people. So that's the end. I just wanted to thank all the people who helped make this possible, um, whether they just sent a short email back saying, we don't have that information or our organization didn't exist at that time or some really helpful things um, and some very helpful information and pictures. So that's it. Wow. Um, thank you so much, Pamela. Um, it's, it's a difficult history to hear about. Um, I'm amazed, as always, at your ability to pull together these resources. And in this case, you know, not just the newspaper clippings about the case itself, but also the photographs of the places where Timothy or Frank Pettis lived and worked and really tracing his steps on that last night of his life. Um, it really felt almost like we were, you know, in the scene and sort of following along. So I, I can only commend you for just incredible work as usual. Well, um, I'm, glad, I'm glad that helped. Yeah. That's what I, I hope was, spoke was like, this is what happened. And I'm tremendously thankful that the um, coroner's inquest record is so extensive. And then that I was able to find pictures and maps and stuff to kind of place it all. Cause I read it through the first time. It's like, wow, this is a whole lot of information. I have no context for this or what's going on. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the part of the program where we have time to ask questions of you and get to know a little bit more about the work that you did. I didn't see any questions come in through the chat. So if you have some now, feel free to uh, 
uh, add those questions to the chat. But I have plenty of questions that I could ask. <laughs> um, and I guess the first one is thinking about what your expectations were going into this research and where it ended up. Would you say that uh, you learned anything um, unexpected during this process or uh, were you able to uncover the answers that you were looking for? I guess, again, just being able to tell the story of this heinous crime and have it not fade into the mists of time was, I think, um, a constructive thing. Um, you know, it's you kind of want to play Clue, the game of Clue. It's like, well, this person did it with this weapon in this location, and I don't think we can do that. Um, I think it's worth considering now nearly 100 years on in the age of body cameras and cell phones and surveillance, you know, we sometimes, maybe ideas come to us now that did not occur to the grand jury and folks at the time. Or, or you know, maybe there's some suspicions that the community was not sure that they were getting all the support from law enforcement. So um, these yeah. are real lives with real, you know, people with real, you know, family and stuff. And so I think you know, as, as Governor uh, Pierce had said, this needed to be brought to a court and, you know, and tried, and that never did happen and it never could happen. So conjecture is probably not entirely helpful, but thoughts pop up. So thinking about something you just said and how local law enforcement um, really let down the Black community of Marshfield in its responsibilities to look into these and potentially even being implicated as suspects uh, in the killing of Timothy Pettis. Um, it really struck me seeing how you cited multiple examples of where, um, you know, Timothy and even his wife um, were arrested for altercations that they had with white people when it was the white individuals that instigated those incidents in the first place. Right. Um, and it's a it's not surprising to see that. And in fact, it's painfully familiar because these are things that we still see today. Um, another question I have for you is, you know, thinking about this case in the history of Coos County and Coos Bay and its relationship, uh, at least in the history of violence in Oregon to the killing of Alonzo Tucker you know, what is it about Coos County that these incidents happened when there were so few people of African descent that called it home in this era? Do you think that there's anything to that? Would you would you say anything about that relationship? There could be. I mean, but one thing it occurred to me today, the fact that there was even the opportunity for violence to happen to black people was because Coos County allowed black people to live there. There may not have been many, but we have to remember at this time, there were a lot of towns in Oregon with sundown laws or at least sundown policies where basically people of color were not allowed to live at all. So if you're not even allowed to be there, you know, thing, bad things cannot happen, which is certainly no excuse for this. But I mean, I guess in some way we need to give the people of Coos Bay and Marshfield credit for allowing people to live in their community when so many others wouldn't. So, but it was, you know, I, I can't help thinking that, sure, there was connections there between what had happened 22 years earlier. Um, yeah, and sadly, similar things did happen to Black people, both in Oregon and other places. But considering how few there were over decades, yeah, it was a significant thing that two young men were murdered. I also think about this period in time in Oregon history and how in Southern Oregon in particular, the mid to or early to mid 1920s is the peak of the Oregon Ku Klux Klan. And when I first heard of the murder of Timothy Pettis, my thoughts immediately went to assigning responsibility to the Klan. Um, but I didn't really see that reflected in your presentation. Did you have any expectations of finding clan involvement through your sources? 
I didn't really have that expectation. I knew that that was definitely a thing. Like I, I mentioned, there was a uh, there, one of the Republican candidates for uh, governor just two years earlier had Klan backing, as did then um, the Democratic candidate who won. So yeah, that was very pervasive at the time. Um, it seems like in what I uncovered, it all happened so quickly. It seems unlikely that it was a concerted effort by a group of people or even, a, you know, it's not like even in the case of Alonzo Tucker, there was a chance to get people riled up and to sort of descend on Marshfield and we're going to do a thing and we're going to make an example um, that whatever happened happened very quickly and probably really secretly. That's true. But I also think about sometimes, you know, what makes something a lynching? Is it the rope? Right. Because in this case, you know, Timothy Pettis might not have been strung up and hung to his death, um, but it certainly seems like there was some vigilantism going on here, particularly on behalf of the soldiers that, uh, you know, were in town. Um, and the fact that this was also mutilation involved is very reminiscent to lynchings that we see in American history. So to me, I sort of struggle with the distinction between a regular killing and a lynching. Um, to me, I, I could see some someone making a good case that this this could also be considered another lynching in Oregon's sure. history. I mean, it was clearly a crime with great malice involved. And I found it very odd, at least 99 years later, to see that, you know, the prevailing theory was, well, this had to have been done by another Black person because basically no right. white person cared enough to kill him. And you know, and that there was no motive, but I think racial animus was plenty of motive. Yes. So we did get a question in the chat here. Uh, the question is, were there similar instances of violence against native people? Was that a part of your research? Did you find? I'm afraid that was not part of my research. Um, so I'm not qualified to answer that. Um, there may have been, this is just me talking off the top of my head, there may have been less of that because, you know, some of the earliest white people who moved into the community were men and there were no white women. And so they had children with indigenous women and that may have like diffused a little bit of that. I don't know, or there might've even been a feeling, well, they were here first, but I don't know. I'm not qualified to really, yeah. I have not uncovered that. But it was, and also um, the colored school in Marshfield that was started in 1903, which basically it seems only the Trollinger kids and the oldest Gao Huai boy attended. So they, they, it was so important to them to not have any students of color that they paid a separate teacher to teach just like less than a handful of kids. Um, it doesn't appear that there were any indigenous children there. And I don't know whether that was because they had been sent to Indian boarding schools or not. But. That's a really important point, right? So maybe we don't see in Marshfield at this time, these overt acts of physical violence committed against native people, but that's only because there had already previously been the very real violence of displacement, cultural and physical genocide taking place, diseases. Um, so I would say, yeah, we, we know uh, of violence against Native peoples, but perhaps it looks different. Right. Uh, well, I have one last question for you. It's our send-off question. Okay. And that is, how would you say the work that the information you've uncovered has changed our understanding of local history? Wow, that's a big question. Um, well, it certainly shows how even something that's really graphically violent and you would think would stay in the resident memory of a location can just like evaporate. But that if you, if you look down deep enough, you know, there are resources available where you can get tons of information on a lot of cases. You just have to get that one kernel of information and then go with it. But um, yeah. Sadly, I think it didn't uncover anything extraordinary in the fact that we know that there is tremendous racism 
in the country at large, but in Oregon in particular, and that Oregon's unique situation is we will just make color, people of color go away and not let them be here. Well, uh, whether or not it's changed how we think about uh, this place in time, um, you certainly have revealed a great deal of new information, at least to me, and I'm sure to many people who will watch this. So I'm so appreciative of you being our history investigator for this episode of Black History Quest and for all of your hard work um, in presenting this information to us. So thank you so much again, Pamela. It's been wonderful to have you here. All right. Thanks, Zachary. Thank you. And so that's going to do it for another episode of Black History Quest. Remember, this was episode two, and you can find recordings of this and every episode of Black History Quest on our YouTube page. I want to go out with another thank you to Roundhouse Foundation for sponsoring Black History Quest. And I want to thank you, our viewers. I really appreciate you being here and checking this out, learning more. If you would like to know more about tonight's episode or future episodes, or if you'd like to consider becoming a history investigator yourself, you can reach out to us at OregonBlackPioneers.org. And we depend on the support of ordinary people to be able to present programs like this one. So if you liked this presentation tonight and you'd like to support this and other programs of Oregon Black Pioneers, I hope you will consider making a donation to Oregon Black Pioneers at our website. So please stay tuned for the next episode of Black History Quest in May where as always, we will try to answer the question, how can one source change history? Thanks so much and have a good night.